discussion um, last time we talked about the Soviet satellites and the Iron Curtain on a pretty quick video. Today we're going to talk about containment, which is going to be much, much longer. Um, so containment, to summarize before we get into the details, is the <laughs> general um, early Cold War American policy against communism. Um, the idea being containing it where it already exists and preventing it from, from entering new nations. Um, so let's get into it. So we already talked about Stalin uh, consolidating power in Eastern Europe. He's solidifying those satellite states. He's solidifying what countries are formerly part of the Soviet Union itself. Um, and then we see Truman, uh, the Truman administration in particular, focus on containment, which is they say here is, a, is political, ideological, economic, and military measures to prevent Soviet power from spreading. We're going to go into, I think, each of those uh, as we go through here. Uh, the founder of, of containment is George F. Kennan. Um, he is a, he's from Princeton. He was a diplomat career for his whole career. Uh, at this point, he was uh, stationed in Moscow um, and a very good observer of the Soviet Union. And he first wrote these out um, in a telegram he wired to the Secretary of State, which might be Dean Acheson. I forget which, so, which Secretary of State we have at this moment. Um, might even be John Foster Dulles. Um, but he articulated his ideas in 8,000 word telegram. Uh, February 22nd, 1946, which is known as the Long Telegram. Uh, starts out with a pretty bleak uh, look at U.S.-Soviet relations. Um, and uh, he observed that the Soviets uh, had had kind of become more secure in, in, in being um, uh, patient. Uh, I think I mistyped this. Um, um, and patient in, in, in trying to defeat the U.S., right? They're, they're very patient in their ability to kind of wait out the U.S. and then eventually kind of take them out. Um, they don't really focus on, the Soviets don't really focus on alliances. They don't really focus on cooperation with other nations because they believe that they're, you know, way superior and why cooperate with the capitalists when they know it's going to collapse, uh, according to Marxist theory. Um, and then he also knew that the Soviets would try to expand when <laughs> conditions were favorable to them, and it, especially it's going to be favorable in the old col colonial nations, uh, especially in Asia and Africa, which is true. Um, our Kennan does uh, remain a little bit optimistic um, that the U.S. can defeat the Soviet expansion if they are proactive about it and can do it without any major conflict. Okay, so that's the long telegram. And then in 1947, the next year, Kennan writes an article published in the journal Foreign Affairs using the pseudonym Mr. X, where he advocates for a very long-term uh, containment of Russia. Again, patient, kind of matching the Soviet patients. Um, and then uh, basically by the application of a force where the Soviets try to in implement their own policies, right? So... Um, he, he says that the Kennan, Kennan also says that the U.S. needs to develop kind of a propaganda machine to promote U.S. values and interests globally. Um, and if it doesn't, uh, the Soviets are going to take over post-war leadership because they're also doing the same thing. Right. Um, and then later on, so we have three journals, three newspapers or journals or magazines, Foreign Affairs, Life and Readers Digest, that his call for containment is published in. Um, and the Truman, uh, the, the Truman administration uh, is also very receptive. So it's not Dean Acheson. Let's see who the Secretary of State was uh, in 1946, just to make sure we, we know who the, James Burns. So I don't think we need to know him. Just know that it's not Dean Acheson. It's a guy named James Burns. So I don't think ever shows up in this entire resource, so that's okay. Um, future Secretary of State Dean Acheson had already started to translate Kennan's blueprint into policy by the spring of 47. Um, is he the... Uh, the, the, okay, Secretary of State. What's the Secretary of State in the U.S.? That's a good. That's a good place to start. Let's see. Let's keep this open because there's a lot of Secretary of States during this time period. Um, George Marshall is going to be the next one. Uh, Dean Acheson is going to be 1949 to 1953. Okay. So uh, let's talk about the political containment uh, with the Truman Doctrine. And the first application of containment comes in the Mediterranean where we see both in Greece and Turkey, we're seeing civil wars um, that are going to that are, are going to possibly bring communists into power. Um, and on top of this, Britain, who had previously provided aid to these countries, said they can't do it any longer due to World War II and the depletion of their resources. So uh, on March 12, 1947, 
Uh, Truman asked Congress for almost $400 million in aid for Greece and Turkey. Um, and he, he, he justifies this by saying that there is a larger, there, there, in Greece and Turkey, it is representative of a larger clash coming on between the irreconcilable ways of life between the communist and capitalist uh, societies, and that the U.S. is morally bound to defend free peoples resisting subjugation uh, by armed minorities, which are the communist minorities or outside pressure, which is the Soviet Union. And this declaration is, is what is known as the Truman Doctrine, that the U.S. would intervene wherever communists were, were trying to take power. They say here, seek to sow confusion and disorder. Um, and so the Truman Doctrine replaces the Monroe Doctrine uh, with the, the Monroe Doctrine plus the Roosevelt Corollary. Uh, the Monroe Doctrine had been the focus of the U.S. foreign policy for since the time that Monroe was president, which is early 1800s. Um, and the Monroe Doctrine, if you don't recall, is that the Europeans should not intervene in any any uh, uh, conflicts in the Western Hemisphere. They should not get involved in the Western Hemisphere. Um, and then the Roosevelt Corollary came on top of that under Teddy Roosevelt that said that the U.S. can actually intervene in Western in the Western Hemisphere whenever their interests are being challenged. Um, and so we're basically kind of taking the Roosevelt Corollary idea and expanding it worldwide, right? Um, and so, uh, on top of this though, for the first time, we really see Truman, Truman commits America for the first time to active at foreign policy instead of passive neutrality type of foreign policy. Right. Um, and, and really, really cements into the books that there is this struggle with the Soviet Union. And again, the cold war has begun. <laughs> um, so we've got, you know, we've got Churchill's speech, we've got, you know, possibly the, the, the conferences we've got. The Truman Doctrine speech, there's a lot of times when the Cold War has begun. Economic containment. All right. So um, so Truman uh, agreed with Kennan's description of communism, which I quote, a malignant parasite which feeds on diseased tissue. So communism will become popular wherever there is struggles, right? Wherever there are struggles, communism will become very, very popular. Um, and the place that's struggling right now in the early, in the late 1940s is Europe, uh, because of the destruction of their infrastructure industry and farming, uh, due to World War II, led to poverty for millions of people, and again, made the region vulnerable to communism. Um, and so after the aid to Turkey and Greece, which was fairly successful, Truman seeks to implement this kind of idea in a much broader area, and specifically to all of Europe. Uh, where, again, Europe has food shortages and fuel shortages and key commodity shortages, and all of these threaten the economic collapse of Europe, right? And this is first unveiled by his second secretary of state, I believe he's the second, it might be his, yeah, seems to be his second, his second secretary of state, George Marshall, um, who gave this speech about this plan to Harvard University graduates in June of 1947. So the European Recovery Plan I'm going to bold and underline this. I think that's important. Uh, the European Recovery Plan uh, provided $13 billion of aid to Northern and Western Europe, which in today's terms is $132 billion, which is a decent chunk of money. Uh, this is better known as the Marshall Plan, uh, lasting from 1948 to 1951. Um, and so uh, a lot of different types of nations here, kind of in, in broad categories, get money from uh, from the Marshall Plan. So we have the Allies, Britain, France, they obviously are going to get a lot of money. Um, and then neutral nations that did not participate in World War II or tried to not participate, Sweden, Switzerland, and Austria, which Austria wasn't actually neutral during World War II. They were brought into Germany in the Anschluss. Um, but, you know, for our purposes, we're going to call them neutral. And then the former Axis foes of Italy and West Germany even get um Marshall Plan aid. So let's take a look, see if we can pull up a map here. There we go. Yeah. All right. So here we can see uh, all the countries that get uh, aid. Spain doesn't get aid at this point. I believe they're still, they're under the Franco regime, which is kind of fascist. So they're not helping them. Uh, you see uh, Greece. Um, I don't know if this is all of Greece at this point, because there, there will be kind of breakup of countries here. Uh, Turkey, uh, Italy. Austria, Switzerland, West Germany, uh, Belgium, Luxembourg, Netherlands, France, Portugal, uh, Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland, England, um, 
looks like you know, Scotland's. Yeah, they're they're calling. They're kind of doing. They're lumping Britain together. Iceland, um, and then uh, Sweden and Norway. Finland does not get any uh, because Finland's kind of under the uh, Soviet control at this point. Because if you recall, the Soviets defeated them in the Winter War during World War II, so they're kind of had control over that. So uh, this brings a lot of former wartime enemies into the American sphere of influence, right? Basically, um, not a bribe per se, but it kind of feels like that, right? This bribe to like bring them into to prevent them from being communist. They did offer the Marshall Plan to the Soviet Union and its satellite states, so they offered it to everybody. And the Soviet Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov, who will come up again. Uh, rejects this offer uh, Stalin told them to. And what he says is that this is a capitalist plot to do two things, to undermine Soviet security and promote American expansion, which he's not wrong. That's exactly what it's meant to do. And then Moscow uses political influence to ensure that Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Bulgaria, and Albania uh, rejected uh, this money. So let's see if I can let's see how my geography is. Poland right here, Czechoslovakia, Albania. Um, who do we say? Uh, Hungary? Yeah. And then, is this Bulgaria? I think this might be Bulgaria. Yeah. So those countries are rejecting it due to Soviet pressure. Um, got a little image here from there. We want coal. We want bread from a protest in Germany in 1947. Uh, the Marshall Plan is quite effective, which increases the gross national product, the GNP of Western Europe, by 30% between 1947 and 1951. Gross national product... Uh, is the amount of stuff, you know, the production of within the country, right? Every, not not necessarily counting stuff overseas um, that are, you know, created by European uh, firms. And so this set the stage for division of Europe that lasted the end of the Cold War, right? The countries that took the Marshall A aid and those who did not. Um, and it creates two diametrically opposed societies, a prosperous and politically liberal West and an economically depressed and totalitarian East um, and it made clear that the U.S. is committed to a revived German economy. In fact, this is the centerpiece of the European recovery program is this German recovery. Um, and in fact, this in, in particular, this theme right here, this re revived Germany is really what puts them on a collision course with the Soviet Union because they don't want a powerful Germany. They wanted Germany economically weak, which would allow them to make it communist. Um, and so because of this, Stalin cuts off access to Berlin on July 24th, 1948. Um, and he does this after the Anglo-French-American alliance uh, creates an independent plans to, uh, announces their plan to create an independent German republic uh, in the West German zones. Um, and so the thing about cutting off access to Berlin, Berlin was split, right? Berlin was split between the Eastern, between the Soviets and the Western nations. Um, but it is located within the Eastern German territory of the Soviet Union, um, which uh, allowed Stalin to shut off electricity, railroad, and canal access from the Allied zone in West Germany. So they were able to bring in supplies, but not anymore. Um, Stalin's blockade is designed to force the U.S. and the Allies at large to abandon Berlin, um, along with its plan for a separate Western German state, basically holding the two million residents of West Berlin hostage in exchange for the the Western powers getting out of West Germany. Instead, this is a huge, huge, huge uh, backfire on, on Stalin um, because Truman really flexes the power of the Americans here. Um, he, he circumvents the blockade by ordering food and fuel flown into the city in what is now known as the Berlin Airlift, which the U.S. and British crews would uh, send milk, bread, coffee, and coal every day to they would drop it into west berlin for more than a year um and so they would finally lift the blockade so he announced it july 24th 1948 so almost a year may 1949 where the allies between that time had supplied 2.3 million tons of supplies to west berlin um, at the cost of 73 airmen being killed over uh, soviet land um, and the blockade really galvanizes the allies and Western Germany because it kind of creates this idea of like they're evil and we're not right. Um, creates a, again, a moral, what they call a moral clarity. Like it's very clear that the, the Western nations are doing what's right and the Soviet Union is doing what's wrong. Um, and it badly damages the Soviet reputation within Europe, especially. Uh, he gets no concessions from ending this blockade. Uh, and then weeks later, the Federal Republic of Germany adopts a constitution, which is in West Germany, the, the West German, the, the allied area, uh, 
uh, the capital is the city of Bonn, and they have their first elections in September of 1949. So, you know, May, you know, so maybe June-ish, they announce it, and in September, they have elections. So late May, June, some, somewhere in there. And the first chancellor is Conrad Adenauer. Uh, should I bold this? I think it's worth bolding, probably. Conrad Adenauer. Um, and in response to this, Stalin creates the German Democratic Republic in East Germany. Nice. Democratic. Nice. Um, and Berlin becomes a symbol of Europe's ideological division, especially once you see the Berlin Wall built later on. So, um, military containment. So we did ideological and political, right? Uh, we did economic and political. Sorry, I don't think we're going to do ideological. It's kind of political anyways, right? Uh, the Berlin blockade brings about the creation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, commonly known as NATO, um, a security and alliance. This is an alliance that commits the U.S. to defend Western Europe from Soviet aggression on April 4th, 1949. So if we're looking, you know, it's a little bit before the blockade's lifted. And here are the countries, U.S., Canada, Britain, France, Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg, Italy, Denmark, Norway, and Portugal. I have a map. Uh, oh, sorry, this is the uh, the Warsaw Plan kind of uh, group, but don't worry about that. Uh, can we zoom in? Yeah. All right, so again, we have North America minus Mexico, uh, Iceland, Norway, Denmark, West Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, Italy, Greece, Turkey, Spain, Portugal, France, and the UK. Uh, not Ireland. Ireland and UK are not uh, in good terms. Um, NATO is is a huge, huge departure for the American foreign policy. Um, they have this is the first peacetime military alliance they've ever signed. Uh, so from the beginning, from George Washington all the way to World War II, they had never had permanent alliances. They preferred neutrality and then unilateral action. What that means is that they would act if everybody else acted. Uh, they'd even spent the first years of World War One and World War Two as neutral, neutral nation. They were really sending resources, especially to the British, uh, but they they were neutral, quote unquote, um, mostly because they have a big aversion to collective security and foreign alliances. They don't they don't need it. You know, it's 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 a, it's almost geographic in a sense, right? Since America has, uh, you know, not for its whole time, but it was it was isolated in many ways, right? With Canada and Mexico. And previously, you know, the Spanish colonies and the, and the French colonies uh, uh, and slash British colonies with Canada and Mexico, right? The U.S. had just been isolated from everything geographically. And so it made sense to also be uh, isolated politically, right? Um, and Congress approves American membership into NATO, which is, um, you know, a sign of the times. Because if we go back to World War I and the League of Nations, um, the U.S. the U.S. Congress did not necessarily accept a lot of the League of Nations stuff, uh, and then according to Article Five of the treaty, each member state pledged to come to any other nation's aid if attacked. So if you attack any nation, if you attack Luxembourg, you're going to get U.S. right. Uh, modest manpower commitments for the U.S. Let's look at that in here. Uh, for the U.S., uh, only two of the 14 divisions in Europe were going to be American, um, but it symbolized America's embrace of international leadership in the early Cold War. They kind of had to with the Soviets on the other side. Soviets don't under un, unveil their European alliance until, what, five years later? Six years later? Yeah, six years later, May 14th, 1955, which is the Warsaw Pact, which brought the Eastern Bloc nations uh, into a def defensive security alliance with the Soviet Union. I did not get an image of this. Let's get an image of this. Um, ooh, that's a big image. All right. Um, let's go here let's go here and then let's go here and then there so, all right so here you can see nato and here you can see the warsaw pact east germany czechoslovakia hungary romania bulgaria albania poland the soviet union yugoslavia not in it because again they've kind of separated themselves from the soviet union as they even though they're both communist uh, austria remains neutral which is a little surprising switzerland though not surprising they are well known for being a a neutral nation right Okay, um, and so uh, we see, and here's that list again, East Germany, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Albania, Bulgaria, and the Soviet Union. So the formation of NATO shows a lot of anxiety among the American foreign policy officials um, in terms of how prepared they were for full-scale scale war at this time. And um, we see about, so if we go back to the original, was it 1946, 47 was the first? Yeah, so 46 is when the first kind of the, the long telegram is made. 
Um, and so about four years later, where do you go? Four years later, 1950, Kenneth's containment idea, uh, specifically containment of that military conflict, loses ground to a little bit more hard, hard hitting analysis in terms of like what is required. It's a little more like um, I guess I guess the word is less optimistic, maybe. Um, and this is articulated in a top secret memo called the United States Objectives and Programs for National Security, which is known as NSC 68, presented to the president April 7th, 1950, by Paul Nietzsche, or he's the primary author. I don't know if he gave it to him, right? Paul Nietzsche, uh, who had replaced Kinnan as director of the State Department's policy planning staff. So Kinnan got a, got a promotion probably after the Kinnan, you know, the containment policy was was brought to, brought to light and, and implemented. Uh, Ken, so Nietzsche replaces Kennan as the director of the State Department's policy planning staff, um, and he advocates for a much more aggressive Cold War strategy with large increases in defense spending and increased military intervention uh, to make sure that the um, Soviets are not a threat. Um, and Nietzsche's worldview is what's called hawkish. And hawk, there's the, 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 the hawk's notion in politics, right? War hawks are people who, who believe war is good. I don't know if good is the right word, but like, they kind of seek it out in a way, right? They think they think that it's beneficial in one way or the other. <clears throat> so he sees the, the Cold War as a zero-sum game, which I kind of went to extra detail than the resource did. It's a game theory game, zero-sum games, where the amount one side wins is equal to the amount the other side loses. So the there it's almost like utility in, uh, uh, in a Pareto efficient economy, right? It's like, you know, you can't you can't take anything from somebody else without giving without uh, uh, giving it to somebody else or vice versa, right? So, um, and yeah, it's a zero-sum game between these two systems uh, that are not conducive. Uh, and if you view the Soviet Union as existential threats, right? Basically saying that like they are a threat to America's existence as a as what we are as capitalist demo democracy, right? Um, and the escalation of, coal, of the Cold War in Europe and Asia gives a lot of credence to Nietzsche's assessment. Um, which leads Truman and the next presidents to commit um, unprecedented, I think that's probably the best word, right? Unprecedented resources to beat the Soviets. Um, and NSC 68 moves away from containment um, and kind of moves to a much more aggressive policy. Um, no immediate impact here, but it does provide the basis for a surge in U.S. foreign interventions, um, starting with the Korean War. Um, and then finally, oh, we do have ideological containment. Um, and so we see NSC 68 provides a boost to America's cultural diplomacy because it calls for not only a military offensive, but a psychological offensive to counter Soviet propaganda uh, in their attempt to influence world public opinion. Um, the U.S. begins utilizing cultural diplomacy. I think I'm going to actually do this. Here. It's an important term. They, they bring this up a lot. Uh, they began using it originally during World War II, and the Office of War Information coordinated efforts to boost morale on the home front uh, under the euphemism information. Uh, the euphemism is propaganda, right? That's what it's a euphemism for. Um, and they targeted foreign populations beyond enemy lines with leaflets and radio broadcasts on the Voice of America radio network. Uh, and between June 6th and May 8th, uh, June 6th, 1944, May 8th, 1945, so... By the time the, the Americans stepped foot in France and the Victory in Europe Day, the Office of War Information dropped more than 3 billion flyers. I'm assuming mostly over Europe, if not only over Europe. Um, now, the American public and Congress were not too big on a robust information program in peacetime. Um, it had helped, you know, get victory and Truman's support of... of in, or sorry, it helped the Americans get victory in World War II, and Truman was a big fan of the Office of War Information and the cultural cultural diplomacy game. Um, but the term propaganda is associated with Hitler's Germany and his Nazi minister of propaganda, just Goebbels. Um, and to critics of the information program, a state-sponsored information service was a waste of taxpayer money. Oops. Um, and at worst, it's to, it's it's a beginning of a totalitarian state, uh, destroying American liberties and individual. Um, and especially Republicans from the Midwest, which was notoriously isolationist, which makes perfect sense, right? They're literally like it's just America surrounding them, pretty much, right? And a little bit of Canada, you know, they're not they don't they don't need to get involved with anybody. 
Uh, and then Southern Democrats opposed the newly formed uh, government's uh, agency, the Interim Information Service. Um, and then on top, top of this, the these isolationist Midwesterner Republicans and the Southern Democrats rejected cultural relations in general. And in fact, the word culture in itself was uh, um, was not favored, uh, which kind of shows the the power of language, the power of cultural diplomacy in its, of itself. Because since the New Deal had been linked to unsavory leftists, which basically means communists, right? And this, that's that's what they would tend to link leftists with. All right. I'm not saying leftists are communists. I'm saying that the American idea, the vision of culture uh, and, Amer and leftists tended to be associated with communists. In 1946, the Republicans win the midterm Congress election. So if you don't know how this works, very briefly, there are, uh, you know, there are elections every two years, right? There's presidential elections every four, but there's elections every two years for all of the seats in the House of Representatives, and I believe one third of the seats in the Senate. Um, and so uh, when those elections occur in a non-presidential election year, and that's called a midterm, right? Uh, middle of the presidential term. And so the Republicans win control over the Senate and the House of Representatives for the first time in more than a decade, I believe since 1930. They will, they will say the year later, um, which places cultural diplomacy in a pretty tough spot because the Republicans are not a big fan of it. Um, however, the next year the Cold War escalates and all of a sudden maybe this cultural diplomacy is not a bad idea. Um, American policymaker, policymakers are quickly worrying about Soviet influence around the globe and they question the U.S. efforts to challenge and correct Soviet lies, right, or specifically to counter criticism of U.S. racial discrimination. Um, and so because we see that that used against the U.S. pretty heavily by the Soviets. Um, on top of this, we also see the military rhetoric by Truman and his Truman Doctrine speech, his speech about Greece and Turkey, um, cast the U.S. and Soviets as a battle of ideals and then prompted supporters of cultural diplomacy to pitch the program as psychological warfare uh, to the skeptics. Um, but opposition still goes on, especially they talk about Representative Forrest Harness of Indiana. He's an Indiana Republican. Uh, he's worried that the State Department's government propaganda techniques might be directed at Americans, right? Might might go inside, which is really, really not what they want at all. Um, it was originally developed for foreign audiences, but um, not only disapproved this idea of government propaganda being directed at, at Americans is not only disapproved by representative government, it's also against the law. Uh, can I change there? Yeah, sure. Uh, supporters of the State Department uh, continue to apply information instead of propaganda um, to get that congressional money, right? Because again, propaganda sounds, you know, sounds fascist, sounds communist, right? Um, and we see the term, oops, uh, we see the term information applied to overt and covert use of campaigns to influence global, global public opinion. Um, and so we see cultural diplomacy eventually survive and thrive later on. Um, in this politically charged atmosphere uh, because it can match Soviet propaganda. Uh, Truman first endorses this new U.S. foreign policy in the United States Information and Education Act, which is better known as the smith munt Act. Uh, January 27th, 1948, creates the United States Information Agency, the USIA, uh, which serves as a national foreign info information program in time of peace, but in time of war, it is for psychological warfare, um, so yeah, um, defense and foreign policy experts stressed that the Soviet propaganda is very sophisticated and it's got a huge reach, um, but they, they, they say this in exaggeration, right? They, they exaggerate this to the press in order to get people to kind of get on their side about this uh, United States Information Agency. Um, Truman called for a campaign of truth, right? Um, specifically by the Korean crisis because the Korean, the Korean war uh, puts a lot of pressure on Truman's presidency. They, a lot of, in fact, it, it, be, it creates so much pressure, this along with China becoming communist, that Truman does not run for re-election. Um, that's how big of a deal this was. Um, he wanted to also use this to promote freedom against the propaganda of slavery. And he says this in an address to the American Society of Newspaper Editors, April 20th, 1950. Um, nice. So, uh, Conservative critics of Truman, they were actually quite a big fan of this move away from containment. Uh, and a Republican senator had actually called containment painting waste diplomacy, basically like 
in the 1950s jargon, right? Kind of the the diplomacy for uh, um, for women, right? Kind of like you know this this idea of it being a little lighter, not as strong as it needs to be, right? Uh, again, in the in the language of the 50s. Uh, and the USIA did a bunch of things. They stocked embassies with magazines and pamphlets. They produced documentary fil films, and they sponsored Google tours by Americans, especially jazz musicians, as we'll see uh, later on. Um, and Truman's campaign of truth and demonstrated America's resolve to address the cultural aspects of the Cold War. And that is containment and NSC 68 and the propaganda machine going on, the ideological battle going on. Uh, a lot of stuff happening in this section. A lot of, lot of important information. Um, and so in the next one, we will start to talk about the early Cold War in Asia. Uh, but until then, I will see you in the next one. Maybe, maybe I'll see you.